and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon, or Twitter, at EMLC Tweets. Hello everyone, this is Lady Bridget, and we're bringing to you episode number 12, Beltane 2015. In this episode, we have tarot tips. I will teach you about reading the tarot intuitively. After that, Kanu interviewed Heather Green, and she is the editor of The Wild Hunt. This is followed by a song, I Really Want to Know You, which is the Bardic Acapella version, sung by myself, Lady Bridget, and Alpandia and Serona. This is followed by Lord Riken doing his segment, It'll Grow on You, and he's bringing you medicinal spices from your kitchen, and these spices this week are with the letter C. Then we have a treat. It's a workshop from Equinox in the Oaks that was done by Alpandia and Amber Moon on kitchen magic. Now, this was an hour-long workshop. I had to cut most of it out because most of it was laughing and talking and people really having fun and silly, but you couldn't really understand what was going on. So I did severely cut it and I apologize for some of the sound quality, but it was just too much fun not to bring it to you. And then last, but definitely not least, we've been graced with permission to play Emerald Rose's music. And in honor of Beltane, we're going to play Pagan Girl from their album, Bending Tradition. Enjoy! Hello everyone, this is Lady Bridget, and I'd like to share with you how to learn to read the tarot intuitively. This is not about memorizing the meanings. This is about connecting with the cards and learning to let them speak to you and open up your own psychic centers. When I learned to read the tarot, my teacher, Lady Demeter, didn't start me off with the little book that came with the cards, or with any book for that matter. We started by simply looking at the cards and seeing the pretty pictures. After all, a witch's greatest tool is observation. Our first homework assignment was to divide the deck into three piles. The cards we really liked, the cards we disliked, and the cards that were in between. In this way, we learned to observe how each card made us feel. What feelings did each card bring up for me? I had to really sit with the card to discover that, and it took several nights to do. This was just the first step. By the way, the deck we used to begin with was either the Rider weight or the Universal weight. This is because the imagery in these cards is pretty much the standard. If you find another deck that speaks to you more, then by all means use that deck. The deck I use most often is the Hanson Roberts deck, and the imagery is similar to the Rider weight. The next step was to take the cards and tell a story. So to do this, you might start with the Fool, who is seen as someone stepping off with his bag on a stick and his dog, perhaps on a journey. He doesn't know where he is going, and he apparently packed light, because that bag is too small to hold my clothes, even for overnight. Pull another card and see what happens next on the journey. In this story, the next card I pulled is the Two of Cups. This is a boy and girl, or a man and woman, soulfully gazing at each other and holding two cups. This looks like a card for lovers, and indeed, these two seem to be very into each other. Maybe one of them is the Fool? The next card I pulled is the Three of Swords. Uh Uh-oh. This card has three swords struck through a heart, and it's pretty obvious that this picture shows someone being stabbed in the heart three times. Looks like the lovers are quarreling, and one of them has really hurt the other one. The next card is the Eight of Cups, which shows a woman with her back turned to eight cups all stacked up and she is walking away from them. It looks like the woman in the story is leaving, and not looking back. Even though she has eight cups in front of her, she is no longer interested in any of them. Perhaps the heartache from the last card was too much for her, and now she has chosen to leave rather than take another chance on this relationship. Maybe the fool in the first card was the gentleman in the second, and they fought, and now she's had it, and she's leaving. Do you see how this can work? Let your imagination tell a story with the cards and let them speak to you that way. 
This isn't really doing a reading. This is using the cards to speak to you and inventing a story to go along with them. Okay, once you have done some of these, now it's time to open a book and look at the symbols on the cards and what they mean. I recommend using any of the Eden Gray books, for example, The Complete Guide to Tarot, or use a book that comes with your deck and explains the symbolism. Go ahead and buy the big book if there is one. Don't rely on that tiny pamphlet that comes in the box. That little pamphlet might be nice, you know, just to remind you, but for explanations, you need something with a little more meat. It's good to learn what these symbols mean, such as the roses in any card are for the physical body and the lilies are for spirit. So when you see a card with lilies and roses, you know that the subject transcends both spirit and matter. When you see astrological symbols on the cards, for example, it can signify that there is an astrological aspect to the issue, and it can also be a message that it's time to get an astrology reading done to determine if there's something in your chart that is happening, especially if the reading is about something that may have been going on for years. And now, one last tip. The cards have many different meanings, and I'm often asked how to decide which one is relevant in any given situation. I will share with you the intuitive technique that I use. Look closely at the card and see what jumps out at you first. What is the first symbol that you notice? Let's look at the star card, for example. If you don't have a deck, you can go to Google Images and search for this card to see it. This is a picture of a nude woman kneeling by a small flowing water or creek. She is kneeling with one knee on the land and one foot in the water. She is pouring water from a pitcher into the river and also pouring water from a pitcher onto the land. Some of the water flowing from the land ends up back in the river. Above her are seven stars. Maybe they represent the seven days of the week. And one is brighter and larger than the others. Behind her is a tree with a bird in it. Okay, so what does this mean? Overall, the star card is considered a fortunate card. To me, it shows someone taking action. She is actively watering both the water and the land. She is covering both bases and not worrying about which one is right, but doing both. Water represents emotion, and if the water is the first thing that jumps out at me, I might tell the person I am reading for that they need to express what they feel. If the first thing I notice is the stars, I might say that they need to look up and not concentrate so much of their energy looking down. If I am noticing the pitcher of water flowing onto the land and back into the water, I might tell them that all the emotion and energy that they are pouring out into this situation will be returned to them. If the person is asking me for advice on how to take off bad luck, then this card indicates that they need to take cleansing ritual baths. While the moon is waning and end this on a dark moon since there is no moon in the sky in this card. So this is one example of how to utilize your intuition when you are reading tarot. I urge you to give this a try and relax into the process. To learn to read tarot intuitively, you need to first connect with the cards and then to allow the cards to speak to you. Go ahead and learn the symbols because that will help your conscious mind connect with your subconscious mind. But do not worry about memorizing all the meanings because the cards are so much more Learning to read this way helps open the psychic doorways that the tarot can unlock. Good luck. Blessed be. This is Connie. I'm a member of the Everglades Moon Local Council of the Covenant of the Goddess, and I'm interviewing Heather Green, the managing editor of The Wild Hunt. Heather, we wanted to talk to you briefly about your time with The Wild Hunt and how you got to be the managing editor. Hey, sounds great. Um... I'm glad to be here and, and glad to um, provide uh, your listeners with um, some good information, a little history of the Wild Hunt and myself. Great. Thank you. How did you first get involved with the Wild Hunt? Um, well, uh, it was in 2012. Um, Jason uh, Pitzel Waters was writing by himself. He was it was still operating as the lone writer and. He needed some relief um, and wanted to expand the wild hunt, so he knew me through my work for COG, um, Dogwood Local Council in Georgia, 
and um, and some of the work I was doing for them as public information officer, PR. So he had seen my writing and he called me up and said, you know, would you like to write for the Wild Hunt Weekly and do news? And um, and I said, hey, this is this sounds great. Let me give this a try. So yeah, so and, and the rest is history. <laughs> so uh, two years later, I became the managing editor. And how's that experience been so far? Um, writing or being editor? It's two different experiences. Well, are you writing less than you were before in this new role? No, I am writing more, actually. Um, it started out that um, over the two years I was writing once a week, and then I took twice a week. Um, and that was last spring. I started to um, do twice a week as Jason decided he wanted to retire. So. In the spring of last year, around this time, um, we had decided on a transition um, uh, process to go from, for me, to go from uh, just being a weekly writer to being the managing editor. And it, had, it was a, really a six month, it was really, we, and we did it Ostara, well, maybe more like Beltane to um, Samhain, really. And um, it was that period of time we slowly transitioned. So I went from doing writing to once a week to twice a week, to three times a week. Now I am writing three times a week, responsible for three posts a week, and as well as everything else, um, so, and other writers. Yep. And so you oversee uh, um, a stable of contributing uh, authors or journalists? Yep, we have two weekly writers, um, Kara and Terrence, and um, they, are, they appear on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, they're, they do news, and then we have a group of eight columnists who are once a month and they each have their own little a niche um, and subject that they cover and their own voice and they're a little bit more flexible in what they do. They sometimes cover a little more newsy stuff, sometimes it's more poetic and they give us a nice round feeling to the wild hunt and they appear once a month on the same uh, day of that month, whether it's the second Saturday or third Saturday. And so yes, I oversee all of them and edit all the pieces before they get published. It's certainly been uh, a labor of Jason's over the years to develop the Wild Hunt, and uh, his involvement had really been fundamental to the profile that it has gotten in the pagan community. Um, so, do you know how he feels at this point about uh, stepping away from being the managing editor, and does he still contribute to the Wild Hunt? Or has he really turned it over as a project to you and the uh, contributing authors that you have? Um, well, the second part of that is is easy to answer. He is fully retired. He does not contribute. Um, he does offer me support because I'm still learning some of the back end as well as some of the, the trials and tribulations that come along. So he is always there. If I need, hey, how do you, how did you manage this situation, or um, who, what do you know about this? So he has a he's a wealth a resource for me personally um, as I learn the process and grow with with the wild hunt myself. However, he's not contributing; he is fully retired, and um, and I think that he got to the point where handing it over was no was not difficult. Um, I think that he was ready. I think it was it was a, a change that that was meant to happen. It needed to happen, and he, and he's good, and he's happy with. He said repeatedly that he's happy with my um, uh, my role and how I'm managing it, and so I think he feels comfortable, and and I think it's good for him, and I am happy to uh, take take the role and to see him go on to do whatever he's going to do in <laughs> in his next journey. So it's been a positive thing. I know you were involved with the Wild Hunt, and it's already been kind of you know, an international publication, not just because it's on the internet, but because of the um, readership that it has. So have there been any things about being at the helm of the Wild Hunt with that level of profile um, in the international pagan community that have really stood out to you? Things you might not have expected about taking the helm or being the, the, the real leadership um, for the Wild Hunt at this point? Um, I think I took it over slowly enough that I kind of saw what, what Jason was living and was able to adjust. So uh, there hasn't been anything that has been singular, singularly shocking. Um, 
But for me, who's always been in the background, and I've always been the top person who's the directing the theater or who's doing the PR in the background for people who are the front, front men or front women. Um, so having a more forward position is a somewhat of a personal adjustment for me. And, um, and understanding the, the role of the wild hunt in people's lives. That's something that's really important for me to completely understand and grasp. And sometimes it amazes me um, when I see that, when people say, wow, this really is something that, that makes my life better. It's a contribution to my spirituality and, and, and I, wow, you know, that's, that's, I don't know how to express it. It's like, really, wow. <laughs> So uh, that's been the biggest thing, I think, for me. But it is an adjustment, and I think I'm still adjusting. Did you expect that you might um, get that kind of direct feedback, or were you expecting that it may feel a little more isolated than it's been? Um, I knew I'd get direct feedback, but it doesn't change the impact it has. Um, you know, the negative stuff hurts, um, and all of my writers will tell you that. Uh, that the negative stuff hurts a lot, but when you have somebody who who is in an isolated community and has the internet, doesn't have a lot of uh, access to other pagans, and they say, you know, the wild hunt is making, you know, is really, I go to it every morning. We get people that tell us, I, every morning I open up and I go, the first thing I do is go to the wild hunt to read the news or to read what you guys are saying. To know that we're having impact on people's lives positively is it never gets tiresome. You never get tired of hearing that because it really makes you it makes you want to do it again. You know, get up and say, "I got to write this because this is making a difference," and that and that's what keeps you going. That's great. Did you come into your role with Dogwood and then the Wild Hunt with a background in writing or media relations? Um, yes, uh, and that is why I got um, asked to take the role of Dogwood. Uh, and because I have my my degrees in college are in film, um, and uh, as I said repeatedly, my um, what I've been asked is my dad. It was in advertising, so I grew up in the advertising, PR, media world from the time I was tiny, and um, I never looked at commercials the way other kids did. Because my dad was always telling me, "Well, you know what really happened, and this is how we did it." So I always knew the back end of all the way that media worked. Um, and was around it, was in the offices, and even got on sets when I was a kid. I used to go with my dad to the sets of some commercials. So I, I was always around it, and I, I worked in, um, starting freshman in college, I worked for an advertising agency during summers and breaks. Um, I worked in, when I lived in Paris, I worked for the production company there. Um, so, I, and I was in New York, so I was working in Media Central for the United States, uh, and I um, did that. Uh, for years and um, have a graduate degree in film as well and then worked in Atlanta in a, at an international PR firm and actually was really excited I was in Atlanta during the Olympics and was able to work on the um, some of the PR and media stuff for the 1996 uh, Olympics which was really cool. I even held, held the torch which was <laughs> really fun and so yes I had a background and, um, and then became a writer a freelance writer decided to leave corporate uh, and start writing just for freelance. So I had a background in it and um, that's how, you know, the Dogwood people said, hey, you know what you're doing, come on. I said, okay, you know what, I'll do this. And it just, it grew from there. Was there something in particular that led you to um, deciding to become an independent uh, writer and get out of uh, the more the, the corporate um, employment world? Um, it was a combination of things. Um, I, first of all, I had um, my oldest child and I did not like putting him in daycare. But, um, so I said, I don't want, I, that was my primary thing. I didn't want to put him in daycare and be in an office. And so that was sort of the leading factor. And then, you know, when I did that, I said, I don't want to be bored at home. So I said, this is, it was a kind of a simultaneous decision um, to continue the writing because I could do it that way. And so yeah, so that's what, life-changing moment. <laughs> and um, if Dogwood had invited you to uh, work with them as their public information officer, 
uh, you must have had a background in the pagan community before that too. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? My background in the pagan community, well, I, um, I started uh, with, oh, I was pagan before I, I got to Atlanta, um, solitary uh, uh, witch um, studying that for you know, since college, just like a lot of people's story. But, uh, and I became involved with Grove of Phoenix Rising, which is part of Grove of Unicorn, or, or was part of Grove of Unicorn. They're a Wiccan tradition um, that's been in Atlanta since 1980, when did she start? 19, no, I'm sorry, 1992 or 93. Um, and uh, I got involved with them and did my first and second degree and then eventually my third degree. And I've been with them until last year I decided to go solitary, I'm, I'm inactive. Uh, with them, but still work with them regularly, and uh, and I, you know, pagan prides, and and gotten involved with with the community there, and and I guess that's what why they called me in. <laughs> that's great. Um, is there anything else you you foresee for for yourself coming up in terms of where you may um, take the either pagan practice you have or your media relations skills, any places you might be expanding? Um, uh, nothing in particular as far as I, I, my pagan practice, I'm, I'm so, I have so much time is devoted, so much of my time is devoted to the wild hunt right now and so being solitary is very important and I think, I think you ebb and flow with that, uh, people, people ebb and flow and grow in different ways and so becoming solitary that's my path right now. I've, I've been with the group for so many years, it's time for me to do a little private work. So nothing new in, in terms of that, but um, I will be teaching a, uh, a PR class at Cherry Hill Seminary starting at the end of February, so you can go online and I don't know when this when your podcast will be out, but we're starting February 23rd is the first class. Um, so I, I'm happy to share my knowledge of public relations and media relations to empower other people because it's not a skill that a lot of people have experienced or uh, dealt with in the pagan community on a professional level and so if I can help a few people with that, that would be wonderful for me. Um, I also will be speaking um, at the Gaia Festival in Pittsburgh for Beltane, so I look forward to that. So I don't know exactly what she wants me to focus on, but I look forward to being with that community and experiencing the Pittsburgh Pagans and what they do. So that'll be fun. And I, that's that's the way, I'm just keeping the wild hunt going. And I, I don't look too far ahead because I don't know what's gonna come, but I know there's gonna be growth. So when it starts to, when the growth comes, we'll be ready for it. Is there anything that people who may be readers of The Wild Hunt can do to help contribute to the success of The Wild Hunt or the things that you or your contributing authors um, have to do to be able to help keep it uh, a vital part of our community? Um, the best way to help The Wild Hunt, there's two ways that people can help The Wild Hunt other than reading it, which is, you know, that keeps us going is, is the readers. I think one way they can do is, is share our articles, and if you like something that one of our authors is doing, um, share it, or even or contact the author and say we like what you do. That's that's a, another way. I didn't even think about that. But that if you send us a message, um, uh, post a comment. This was really great. We really like this. It made a difference because that makes a difference in our lives and keeps us going. And of course, sharing our articles so our name gets out, so more people are reading. And then of course, the other one is is donating because we're completely we're completely reader funded 100% we have no um, corporate backing or other other ways of raising money we have a fundraising campaign every fall and um, it's done through Indiegogo and um, you can donate and there's different perks you can get um, through that so donating is a huge piece it pays for our writers for all paid as well as our um, back end and if you don't want to wait till the fundraising campaign, which starts around Mavon in September, um, you can contact us. We do have a PayPal account for, to take donations, and there will be a PayPal button eventually. It will appear on the site, so people can donate at any time. And you know, whether it's a dollar, 
for more. Every everything helps, and it, it just is a, it shows us that you want it to keep going because it helps us keep going. So. Great. And where can readers find the Wild Hunt online? Um, <laughs> do I have to look? <laughs> no. no. Wildhunt.org is where we are. You'll find us every day a new article on something. Great. And is there an email address if they wanted to contact the Wild Hunt about donating or um, other matters regarding your publication? Editor at wildhunt.org. Great. Well, Heather, it's been nice to talk with you about the Wild Hunt and your background, and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. This was fun. I want to look behind the mirror of your eyes and see the secret, secret world, the world your worst is This is Lady Bridget, and I'm here with Lord Riken, and he's going to do his segment, It'll Grow on You. We're continuing with the series of the medicines in your spice cabinet, and this Sabbath's episode is brought to you by the letter C. <laughs> so all of the spices you're going to share with us have to do with the letter C. Mm-hmm. Yes, they will. Uh, but before we get started in that, I'd like to say a couple of things. Uh, One thing you might notice a couple of weeks ago was all over the internet that they took a 16th century recipe uh, for medicinal concoction for... um, The one with the cow's stomach? Yeah. Oh, there it is. The one that uses garlic, onion, cow's stomach, and red wine. And you have to prepare it according to the recipe. And that when they did prepare it according to the recipe, it did a fine job on destroying MRSA. I read about that. Yeah, well, the point here is that when they took the separate chemicals, that is, the separate herbs, it didn't do anything. It is a synergistic effect of putting them all together and of preparing them in just the right way. If they just took the four, threw them in a blender together and tried to use it, it didn't work. If they used them separately, it didn't work. They had to prepare it the way they'd figured out to prepare it, you know, hundreds of years ago. And they did it. They actually came up with something that worked pretty good for MRSA. But you'll notice that garlic and onion were a strong part of that. Uh, And I need to make a general disclaimer here. When I go running through these in a real hurry because there are just so many in the seas, we're not going to be talking to any great extent except for a couple of them that I'll mention about possible side effects, about medical interactions and such. Please, the whole point of this series is to get across to you that just about everything in your spice cabinet is useful medicinally. To one extent or another, you'll find a whole lot of what's in your spice cabinet is good for flatulence and for gas and uh, for stimulating the appetite. Well, golly gosh, look at that. It's in your spice cabinet. But a lot of times you'll find other good purposes as well. But I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on television. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these things do have contraindications. Uh, 
And some of them can interact with medications that, you, that somebody might already be taking. Some interact with medications you're already taking. And I was astonished to learn that dill uh, can be just as bad as peanut allergies. People can take dill and uh, have an anaphylactic reaction that can kill them. Wow. I didn't know that. I had never heard of that until I was poking around getting some stuff ready for this. Absolutely blew me away. So uh, let's get started. So what you're saying is that people should check with the medications they're already taking in order to make sure that they don't have any bad side effects before they use any of the spices in this manner. There are, there are websites like WebMD that have this stuff. Uh, some years ago, a friend of ours who was a physician poo-pooed everything to do with herbs and all my herbology, and then he saw some of my herbology do quite a job of healing his mother-in-law, and next thing he knew, he went out and bought a $200 book on the uh, uh, chemical interactions between herbs and uh, medications, because he seriously wanted to start investigating the uh, use of literally your spice cabinet and some of such things to help his patients. And he started doing a lot of investigation on it. Unfortunately, some years ago, we kind of lost contact, and I don't know where that all ended up. But we'll see. Anyway, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to cheat here. I use a very large, extensive list to compile this from. So if they mention that list, I'm going to mention it, although will be not much. In other words, in this case, first on the list is going to be capers. This will be really fast. Capers... In the form that we normally get them, that is pickled capers, like in the olives and such, eh, other than increasing your salt intake, I'm not sure what good they would really be, but technically speaking, apparently capers can be an aphrodisiac, and uh, not much else. I'm just mentioning it because it was on the list. Caraway seeds, on the other hand, everybody knows caraway seeds for gas, you know, from the time I was a small child, if you if it's colic, if a baby was had colic or something, you could take some caraway seed and simmer it in water and give it to him in the bottle to relieve colic. You know, caraway for gas and bloating certainly. Uh, caraway also you know, simmering caraway seeds in some as a tea can help to break up phlegm and uh, you know break up congestion in the chest and the throat, uh, relieve menstrual cramps. Uh, it can stimulate menstruation. Now, anything that can stimulate menstruation automatically has a counter effect because it can also, in the proper situation, bring about uh, miscarriage. So anytime you see that a, an herb or a spice can stimulate the onset of your, your period, you have to take the other side of that. that it can also cause a miscarriage and always be careful. Most of the time in... I am not talking here about, and I will mention it when to be specific, like cinnamon. I'm talking about cinnamon, not cinnamon oil. I'm talking about these herbs that are in your spice cabinet where you're simmering the seed, the bark, or whatever, uh, as to make a tea. I'm not talking about medicinal level oils. Okay? So let's make sure that's real clear. So caraway can also stimulate breast milk production. Uh... It says, you know, more medicinal uses of the oil for more than eight weeks or strong medicinal amounts can cause miscarriages. Here's an interesting thing, though. Caraway seed can increase iron absorption. Oh, that's good to know. That's very good to know. But if you're going to take caraway seed tea and take iron supplements, you can end up with hemochromatosis. How much would you have to take? Uh, we're not apparently talking... Uh, gallons here we're talking it does such a good job of improving the if you in other words if you're going to eat spinach and you had some caraway tea because you were low on your blood iron the doctor told you eat some liver and eat some spinach and eat some other high iron things you can greatly increase it by simply drinking some caraway tea but don't say if a little is good more is better and start drinking the tea along with taking iron supplements because it does such a good job you could end up poisoning yourself okay so, so a little common sense has to be used. A little common sense and a little research. Cardamom, one of my all-time favorite spices. I use it for everything. Cardamom tea, uh, particularly, you know, basically making 
cardamom into a tea that is simmering the seeds, slightly crushed in uh, hot water for five minutes, and then letting it still is excellent for gum infections. Just switch it around in your mouth, like, uh, you know, rather, you know, kind of like cloves, I guess, but uh, the cardamom is good for strengthening the guns and for cleansing gum infections and also for cleansing the kidneys. Uh, well, you know, I drink cardamom tea almost every day to, to one extent or another. Uh, I'm not cheating here. Apparently, catnip is used in some recipes, so okay. No, I don't even have catnip, and I have 75 spices in my spice rack. Yeah, but it listed it, so I'm playing by the rules here, and I'm including it. Uh, I thought you were just going to use the spices on my spice rack. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, there's a few things you don't have, and there's a reason you don't have a few of them. But catnip is, you know, catnip tea is good for soothing the stomach and uh, helping to induce uh, relaxation and sleep. Uh, I've been using catnip that way for 25 years and didn't find too much on the internet on it, but it's been a part of one of my favorite Nervine recipes for since 1974, I guess. Cassia. Cassia is a blood thinner and a stool softener. Think about it. Every stool softener you can buy in the store, if you look on the ingredients label, you're going to find cassia. So there's no cassia in our herb cabinet, but, you know, somebody may have it. Now let's get on to cayenne pepper or chili pepper, whatever. I am talking the peppers that have between 30 and 50,000 Scoville units. I'm not talking ghost peppers. I'm not talking scotch bonnet. I'm not talking... That's super powerful stuff. I'm talking your Tabasco pepper, your um, chili powder. Chili, well, no, your chili powder. No, I'm really, I'm talking the uh, any of the Mexican bird peppers. Okay, your cayenne pepper is a Mexican bird pepper. So we're talking the fairly mild, hot red peppers that we use. Obviously, the active ingredient is capsaicin. You see that on all your ointments. Interestingly, they say that one of the reasons that it's good for topical pain relief on bad joints and such is that it ties up all the pain receptors on the surface and it's not really relieving the pain it's just that the pain signal can't get through to the brain anymore it blocks it. <laughs> yeah and of course you run the risk of irritating your skin with it but uh as you all have heard if you've been listening to the podcast my master tonic cayenne pepper is one of the ingredients that you're taking internally and it's good Topically, it's good for arthritis, it's good for herpes, uh, the, you know, the rash from herpes, it's good for diabetic neuropathy, and one study even linked it to, but, well, let's say on the counter side, one study linked the topical use of capsaicin to skin cancer. That's one study out of the hundreds, if not thousands, that have been done on pepper. Mm-hmm. But let's just throw that out there. Uh, it can, as believe it or not, it has an anti-irritant. Well, what what are you talking about? Peppers are irritant. Well, they can be anti-irritant too. You, uh, again, going back to my master tonic, you mix that with a little bit of honey, and it makes a wonderful throat medication. Uh, I don't even use it in the master tonic form. The leftover chopped bits after I make master tonic, I then coat them with honey, and then I extract that again, and I use that for my throat medication. And it does a great job. Uh, breaks up congestion and mucus. Well, I think we all know that. It relieves flu and uh, cold symptoms. It's got antibacterial properties, antifungal properties. It's a digestive aid. And it helps prevent blood clots. These things are all pretty much commonplace. You know, everybody knows about them. Uh, it's good for detoxification support in the body. And it's good for toothache relief. If you don't have any cloves on hand, oh, we'll get to cloves in a minute, uh, you can chew a pepper. I'd rather go buy a cloves. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. Okay, so done with cayenne pepper or chili pepper. At any rate, we're just talking your standard peppers. Let's go on to celery leaf. Celery leaf, eh, not much of anything. Celery seed, on the other hand. Obviously, gas relief, again, we're going to keep coming back to that. Uh, celery seed is known to lower blood pressure. Oh. Uh, but again, like I said, celery seed can have a fatal allergic reaction from anaphylactic shock. 
It's, uh, it's, it's compared to peanut allergies. So how would somebody find out if they were allergic to celery seed? The hard way. As you best I can take a tell, little bit? Unless everybody in the world's going to run down to the doctor and get a blood test. Um, you know, the thing is that so much stuff is, produce, is processed in places that may also have processed celery or celery seed or used celery in cooking this or whatever. It's probably much more difficult than trying to find anything that's peanut free. Hmm. And until I did this little bit of looking around on the internet this evening, I had never heard of this either. You know, if I had cooked something for someone and we used celery seed in it and they went into shock, it never would have occurred to me that it would have anything to do with the celery. But be warned, apparently there are people who have an allergy to celery and celery seed and can go into anaphylactic shock. So that's just something to be aware of. Yeah. Who would have known? So, let's see. Done with celery and celery seed. On to clove. Well, we all know. Clove for pain relief. Clove for gum disease. Clove for uh, gargle for sore throats. Clove for muscle relaxer. Yeah, oftentimes, remember, Ben Gay has the hot cool effect and such. Well, Is that from clove? That's from eugenol, the active ingredient in clove. Um, if you had some kind of uh, sunburns and such and you didn't have anything else, but you could boil up some cloves in water, cool the water, soak a rag in it and lay it on, that would help. You use what you got when you have a problem. Now, interestingly enough, the United States Department of Agriculture has downgraded cloves for its pain relief effect. They've downgraded eugenol. I really don't know why. It seems like it's as effective a day as it was when I was a kid and they rubbed it on my gums. <laughs> but uh, there you go. Clove is mostly all about the pain relief and, of course, the flavor. Hmm. Uh, coriander seed. Coriander is an anti-diabetic plant. And again, remember, if something is strongly anti-diabetic and you're on diabetic medication and such, you better do some research. Balance it out. Make sure you balance it out. If you're going yeah. to go on, if you're going to go on something that contains coriander seed as a uh, natural diabetic balancer, then you better be taking your blood sugar measurements a whole lot more often till you figure it out. I certainly know. Um, some years ago, I uh, picked up a uh, pill over in Tampa. Uh, this uh, herbalist over there had uh, made this up for her father, who was a type 2 diabetic. He started taking that, and he went back to being a type 1 diabetic. I mean, literally, he'd been a type 2 for a couple of years. She started giving him this, and it was great. And I was thinking to myself, hey, you know, why wait? Why don't, we, why don't I have to go ahead and start taking that? Well, I took a couple of those tablets, or capsules rather, and I fell flat on my face because I'm um, uh, hypoglycemic. I tend to have blood, low blood sugar rather than high blood sugar, but I thought, well, you know, this can't be that powerful. Boom, hit the floor because my blood sugar just plummeted to nothing. <laughs> So I gave them away to a friend of mine who was type 2 diabetic, and he got a tremendous amount of use out of them. But coriander was one of the ingredients in there. Uh, coriander is also coriander seed as a tea is also anti-inflammatory, and so many of the body systems, it's all about inflammation. So many of our diseases, when you get back to the core of them, it's all about inflammation. Inflammation of your sinuses, inflammation of the intestinal lining, inflammation of this, that, and the other thing. Everything can get inflamed. And coriander tea is good for anything that's inflammatory. It'll help to reduce it. And, of course, coriander seed, anti-gas. And, interestingly enough, it says that, you know, coriander seed tea is uh, full of the stuff that cleanses the body of uh, the uh, free radicals. So that's Free radicals are the stuff that ages you. Free radicals, yeah. Are yeah. The stuff that ages you. It cleans the free radicals out of your system. Cumin. Well, we all know, I think, cumin aids digestion. Boy, I hate having to start everything off with that, but that's why it's in your spice cabinet, folks. But And it tastes good. And it tastes good. <laughs> now, here's the thing. You take cumin seed, lightly crush them, simmer them. That's called jira water in uh, India, 
And it's good for everything. Jira water? Jira, J-I-R-A, Jira water. Wow. It's uh, made by boiling cumin seeds. It's used for heart disease. It's used for all kinds of inflammation. It's used for uh, fevers. It's, it has anti-diabetic properties, anti-epileptic properties. Um, who knew? But cumin, uh, as in the form of Jira water, has a is like one of the 50 most important herbs in Ayurvedic medicine. Hmm. It's right up there, you know, with the big guys. Jira water. The form, you know, cumin as a tea. And it tastes good, like we said. Curry leaf. Curry is... Doesn't do a whole lot on its own. Curry is mostly an ingredient in everything else. It seems to be one of those things that lends itself well to a, uh, to uh, helping other uh, herbs do their job better. It's used curry leaf tea is used as a general tonic. It stimulates the digestive uh, enzymes. Boom! Literally makes food assimilation better. So if you're on a strict diet, you can use it, but. Don't use it if you're eating all the food you want because you're just going to get that much more use out of it. And you probably don't need to get all the use out of it. But uh, curry leaf is good for indigestion and heartburn as well. And that brings us to the end of the seas. Ran through them really quick. But again, I wasn't, except in a couple of cases, we weren't going through it where they were, I wasn't talking too much about any uh, negative aspects of it get online don't believe anything i say check carefully before you start doing any of this um beyond that not a lot to say your medicine your spice rack is one heck of a fine medicine chest and you know i've i used to study nothing but american indian medicinals those things that i could go out and identify and dig in the woods uh and i have tremendous amount of research background and ID on that then I started going worldwide and trying to find the best of everything and these are not the best of everything there's probably not a spice in here that I couldn't give you a specific medicinal herb from somewhere in the world if you could get to an herb store that had them or if you could order them online that wouldn't do a better job but what we're talking about is your baby's crying at 3 o'clock in the morning all right. Now, if you've got a baby, you should have fenugreek, and we'll get to fenugreek sooner or later anyway, because uh, there isn't anything better than fenugreek when a baby's screaming with colic. But we're not to the Fs yet. You just keep teasing us about that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Lord Riken, for sharing your knowledge with us. All right. And as always, check with your doctor if you're on medications already, and do some online research for yourself. Absolutely. There's uh, plenty of online resources that you can cross-index by your symptoms. You know, you don't have to know that you've got, uh, uh, what is it, chronic bowel disease or whatever. You can just cross-check your particular problem and, you know, what you're feeling, and you can go back on that as well. Thank you so much. All right. There's a disclaimer to this workshop. Oh, okay. We don't know what we're doing. Is that the disclaimer? Yes, yeah, we do not know what we're doing. I love your apron. Thank you. We just made them. We're not sure that they're spelled correctly. I don't think anything's spelled correctly. I might accept my name. So the disclaimer is... stitch them, really? We don't actually know anything. Yes. Okay. So we don't really know anything. This isn't very serious. It's very serious. So you have to start from a place of admitting the things you don't know. That's the only way. You have to empty your cup, and then you can put good stuff in it, and then you can make a so brain house and bore children. The second disclaimer is neither one of us have ever done a workshop, so we've never actually spoken in public before. Or about this for any real Right, so if we don't make eye time. contact and just look at our feet, just go with it. We're here for your amusement. Okay, and I think we've achieved that. I'll start. You start. Okay, so this is all about kitchen witchcraft. And you're just going to hold up an empty pot. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people think that doing, making spells and whatnot, you have to have the right time of day and the right 
sign of the moon and the right candle color and like you can really just do awesome Special working dirt from the grave of some ancestor in yeah Zimbabwe. but that's here that's here I know. um because you have to have that but um you can really do a lot of of magical workings in your kitchen with stuff that you have on hand that you can get at Publix or the dollar store or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like, for example, like when you're cooking, if you're making a uh, soup to make somebody feel better, you can start DSL to bring healing energy in, start Wittershins to cast out all the icks that they give have, it extra love. give it extra love, charge all your ingredients. Um, when you start to saute something, you can draw a pentacle with your olive oil in the pan before you start. There's a whole bunch of things you can do, and even if you have to deal with mundane muggles in your life, no one will ever know that they're eating your witchcraft, <laughs> no. which is pretty awesome. And, and you don't have to spend a whole lot of money. You don't have to, like, order it from 13 Moons or Soma Luna or who the heck ever else. You can go to Publix. You can get it at CVS. You can get it at CVS or get it at CVS. <laughs> so um, what, what I do is I do kind of have some tools that I keep for my magic stuff. Like, these are my magic measuring teaspoons. Aren't they cute? They were a present from my boyfriend. Everybody? Oh! There will be audience participation, by the way. <laughs> and if you don't get it right, you get whacked with the rolling pin. And if, you, <laughs> if you get it right... <laughs> wait, there's chocolate? There's no, wait, wait. Can, can I get something right now? <laughs> <laughs> you can get a whack right now. <laughs> it's tough love. Did I, did I stall enough for you? Are you ready? No, keep talking. Okay, so keep talking. Okay. What else is on there? Um, so, like, basically, like, you can talk. do... I'll just talk. So, have a suggestion to yes. you. Yes. A great way to get people at work to like you yes, is to bake sense. cookies. Heck and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and that's a great way to so sell your house. Yeah. You know, you can bury St. Joseph in your front yard or whatever, but, like, when people are coming over to check your house out, bake cookies. Because chocolate chip cookies make people want to buy things. I don't know why that is. It's the vanilla sense. and the, it's a homey thing, you know. They can envision like, like Mother's Milk has that vanilla flavor and smell to it and you associate it. It smells like cookies. So, and I'm sure you all have had experience with whipping up a concoction like awesome Florida water with stuff in your house that you don't need to like, you know. And you can get vodka right near Publix. So... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to talk about altars in your kitchen. Yeah, Let's yeah. About it. <laughs> um, you were talking earlier about how you have mundane people on your Facebook. Yeah. Now, some people, when you go to their house, there's absolutely no doubt crazy stuff they're into because it's all over their house. I have some very straight-laced people that come to my house, so you wouldn't really know. But I do have a full altar in my kitchen. You would just never know. It's awful awesome because it's got it's kitchen tools. It's spoons, it's plants, it's spices, it's a pretty shell, it's, you know, dead baby. The dead baby is <laughs> might be a giveaway. CRISPR. It's not, <laughs> you can't see him. It's, I'm sorry, it's that fell out. Yeah, like, like in, in my altar, because uh, I'm Strega, so um, one of the things that I have that sits on my oven is I have... Um, the kitchen witchy? No, I don't have a, I do have a bukana, she hangs from the ceiling. I have a series who watches over everything. And in fact, when I redid my kitchen, all of my knobs are green to help with prosperity. But yeah, I have like, I have shells and rocks and, and stuff like that too um, for, for the different uh, deities. And as things come into the kitchen, it's like, oh, that needs to be over here. I'm still waiting to get my big giant Italian rooster, which I don't have yet. I was told I need one. And then people just come in and say, well, that's a nice collection of stuff. How pretty arranged that is. Don't touch it. <laughs> okay, so here comes some more art artists. Yes, audience participation. If you had basil and you wanted to do something with it, what would you do? What would be your go-to? Would you to drink a half a cup of basil before flying through the air? Well, I don't do that. We're like a half, like well, like. Says. That was that, man. I missed that part of the book. I have that book here. Where's your book? That's a lot of right there. I have a <laughs> it's in water. I don't know. I'm just saying, is it like, 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 a, like an infusion? <laughs> Angel oil? Are you asking what it's good for? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you <laughs> put it in. Yeah, what's a good, like, if you wanted oh. to do spell work and all you had was basil, what Love kind of spell? Love, health, and protection. Okay. So, what we're going to do, the hands-on part of this today, is we're going to make salt dough. And you can do whatever sort of concoction-wise. I have pretty much everything here you can imagine. 
Um, that you would find in your no, no ground dead babies though that you could find in your kitchen. Yeah, now I am going to dead babies. Sorry. <laughs> I know, right? Say you don't like so and so, or maybe you do like so and so. Oh, it's What's a something from me. nice? But what does it also look like? A person. A person. So if you if you can't sew like I can't sew, maybe I'd make a little bread dough poppet instead of you know. Sorry. So this one has feet. Oh well, that's much better because you can. I think that's a girl. I think that's a boy one, and that was a girl one. It looked like she was kind of in a dress. Oh, maybe this whole set came with buddies. numbers and letters and all this stuff. And I actually tried to make out equinox and the oaks to practice this to make sure I knew what I was doing before we did it. I don't see that. And here. every time I tried to make the tea, <laughs> Mike said, "Why are you making little dough?" <laughs> so do you have some sort of. Fertility issue or <laughs> an upside down a little mm, problem. <laughs> you want to make a present for Coyote. So this was the only number or letter I brought because it looks like something. Else. But there's all different kinds. Um, you're gonna, your best friend is traveling a plane. You want to make them a little something that they've carried that would freak out TSA and cover it in green stuff and really freak out TSA. You can make them some. It's not pot cookies. Too. We're just going to Colorado. So <laughs> I'm going to give everybody a piece of parchment paper. We'll measure everything out. And we're we gonna... have some witchy ones too. Yeah. Like over here. I have a black cat somewhere. They're all over the place. Yeah. Um, there's a cat and a dog. Well, there's a, a bone if you want to do something with animals. A bone. A bone. Ancestor. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know. So we're going to put all the ingredients in here, and then I want every. This is the part where you're going to get messy. And I want everybody to get their rubby little fingers in there, okay, and then take out so much for eating it. There's no, 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 there's no, 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 no. I think this would taste really bad. It's very soft. It's good. Um, if you want, you can poke a hole in it, and we have some string, and you can hang it. You could hot glue a magnet onto yeah. it. Like if you're trying to watch what you eat, you can make something. And there's some books here if you have an idea of what you want to do but don't know what herbs you want. We could also make that up for you. Yeah, yeah. you could. Or we've got some good witches. I mean, like, pick it up and smell it. What does it smell like? What is it? Hey, yeah. it's close. It smells like plastic. Like, I tried to make you something for prosperity with a little bunny one. But I think and I didn't have a vanilla bean, so I used vanilla oh, extract. Oh, so, so what I did was I made two bunnies and put it, the vanilla extract in between it and then stuck the little bunny pieces together. And but you can make... That you can put all your herbs on the inside, you can put herbs on the outside, you can do whatever you want. There's no playing in the mud. It's fine. So, what's the recipe for the salt dough? Okay, so what we're going to start with is four cups of flour or one cup of salt. Yep, and I have a handout for all yeah. the recipes, so I'll just I'll we're gonna it. we're gonna we're gonna put it also. We'll have it on the website. I don't know. They promise. Isn't this like you could so use this in cayenne pepper? Oh, yeah. like that person oh, you don't like at work. Yeah. I would never do that for her. Let's do this. This is so <laughs> gross. All right. Oh, this is kind of gross. It, it's like wallpaper paste and the worst oatmeal you've ever had. Way to sell it, Amber. Are yeah. they supposed to be helping with this? Okay, <laughs> they are, but we're just going to get it started so they don't have to get as gross as we do. You've never made bread, have you? Oh, no, I, I make bread all the time. I, I am really bad at making bread. So. When you do this, th there's so much salt in it, it just feels... Yeah. Like, I think it's good. Yeah. <laughs> See, I told you it was going to be serious at all. It's like a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, travel. all the, all the oh, yes. workshops here have been really, really in-depth and really, really good. But you have to think. I don't want to think all the time. Well, you have like, to think a little bit with this because, like, you have to think about, no, you have to think about, like, what you're doing. Like, I'm thinking about not a lot because I don't know what people are going to want to do right. with their salt though. So you have to talk nice to your dough once it's yours. Mm -hmm. A lot of the recipes um, that I've run across that use essential oils actually say to use the essential oils and the extract. Because the essential oil is kind of like an after the fact. You put it on after you bake it. You wouldn't want to cook that part. So I would put vanilla extract in my little thing and then maybe some vanilla essential oil. But we didn't include any of that because you can't get the essential oils at Publix and that was the whole deal. Yeah. Well, well, you, you can get like peppermint or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. And we have a couple of different, uh, the only thing that I would, I would just caution about with, yes, it kind of is, um, is like, if you have something that, you know, like, uh, know the allergies that people have, right. or like if somebody's really sensitive, you might want to cut back on the cinnamon kind of stuff. You know, we need more of this. But I've put, um, 
maybe not stores, but I have put things in my dough before. Right, and, like, and took that sucker out. Yeah, they, oh, yeah, yeah. They act like vanilla extract and stuff, but not the oil. I wouldn't eat that. Right? Yeah, I'd be worried about the consistency a little bit, but really, I bet if you added more salt, you probably That's still would be fine. So, you know, these okay, would be like water. Pass sort of. You know, I work at a profession where I could have provided every one of you with a pair of rubber gloves, and I didn't. I don't. So that says what all you have to know about what you I think about you guys. You charge something through rubber. Well, yeah, but you could just at least not get really. You should have asked me. I carry them with me. Not rubber. It's rubber gloves. TMI. Oh, okay. We, we don't. We don't. I need them in, 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 in my occupation as well. Is that for checking the prisoners when they come in? Okay. All right. Does every who does not want to touch? Does anybody have like a texture textile here. like oh, issue, texture issue that get they over don't want to touch? We don't have all day. All right, here it comes. Oh, uh, what am I doing? You're touching Push it. around with it, and then you're going to grab a handful that you're going to make your little thing out of. It. Are we grabbing as we touch, or yeah? yeah? Put your hands on these all day. Yeah. If you don't know what you want to do, there's some books down there you can pass it on and come back. <laughs> all right, so Here's over here we've got coriander. Basil. Oh, there's one that was. Please this use one. the resources that are here. So just you know, oops, wow, if your dough is too sticky. Yeah, so out. yeah, we've got turmeric, cinnamon, peppermint. We do have peppermint extract. Yeah, Paragon, vanilla extract. Vanilla, extra. vanilla, coriander, ginger, mint, yummy, rosemary. Pepper is good for to spice yeah. things up, like we love lives. Uh, black pepper corn is also good for protection. Well, that, that's the other thing you can do. Like, if you're doing something for someone and you have their permission or yourself, um, you can put bits of you into it. Your hair, nail oh. clippings, bits of me. Um, spit, spit, spit works. Uh, Coriander is good for love, health, healing, and it eases headaches. So if you suffer from headaches and want to make a charm to put maybe under your pillow. For love, I would use mint and uh, rosemary. Mint, rosemary, um, and maybe a little and ginger. Yeah, the blue one's over there. Yeah. Wow. When you roll it out, just make sure you don't do it too thick because it will never be. Now, we'll give you the directions. Oh, that's pretty. It will make you really want it, but it's the lowest setting on your oven you could possibly put it on, and then just forget about it. And when it starts to turn brown, it's time to come out. You can paint them after they're done if you want. You can also just put them out in the sun. You can do that too. So whatever you guys want to do, if you want to leave them out, so the dough should dry. Well, we can cook them for you. And when you guys are done, take one of these if you want to hang it in one of the ribbons we have. Just cook a hole somewhere in it. Make sure it goes all the way through. I mean, yeah. I also, like, when I'm looking for stuff, I smell the yeah. oven, talk to it, and say, like, hey, what you good for? And if and you, you want to jump in my little thing of dough, you jump in my little thing of dough. So. And it might not make any sense to anybody else, but if it makes sense to you, who cares? This is true. Is everybody done? No, no, no. You have to decide whether you want to dry it in the sun or dry it in the oven. I don't mind in the oven. Dry it in the oven? I do. Yeah. Okay. Just know it's going to take about five hours, and if it interrupts with our dinner, we're taking it out of the oven. That's Okay. Where do you want? Where should we put it? To go yeah. Well, it needs to stay on the paper. So drying it in the sun, you just take it. Off. Yeah, I'm just gonna go put mine down by the drum circle until drum circle because it's hot as heck over there. Oh, and yeah, let it dry. Because I would rather it have sun energy than oven energy. Yeah. Because mine looks like a sunflower. Yeah. Very pretty design. So I'm gonna go put mine down there now. The birds will probably eat mine down there. But that's okay. Yeah. yeah. But that's okay. If it's meant to be that way, it's meant to be that way. Alright, I'm gonna bring mine down. Does anybody else want me to bring theirs down into the sun? Is anybody done? You yeah, done? Closing spots before you finish. Have fun. Next time we do a workshop, we'll, we'll, fig prepared. we'll figure it out months ahead of time and not two weeks before the <laughs> festival. And, and we'll talk more than once before we do it. So. Well, I think like closing thoughts first. Oh, kitchen, like oh, okay. Um, as opposed to, um, I mean, like really, it's all experimentation and having fun. Right. You know, like and make it a mess. Don't be afraid to get it wrong, <laughs> and because you probably will at least once. Well, and then, this week. <laughs> and and just have fun with it. And and don't eat, just because a book says something is these properties. If you're feeling something else from it, totally go with it. See that? That's what you and I agree. Not everybody agrees with that, but I think it's good. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Before we begin our last segment of this episode, we'd like to thank you for listening. 
Putting a podcast together is a time-consuming labor of love, but knowing that someone is listening to our hard work and hopefully gaining something from it makes it worthwhile. Would you let us know you like the podcast by going to our website at emlc.net, click on the podcast tab, and write a comment. Tell us what you like and what you'd like to hear more of on our podcast. And even better, why not leave us a rating on iTunes? Ratings help us become more visible to more people. It's not about ego, it's all about service. Thank you, and blessed be. Where the world is full of women, I'm a color ship mankind. And with this beam, I'm gonna go bingo. It might be hard to make up your mind. I've had my share of failures, but I've learned a thing or two. I've laid down some hard earned guidelines. Listen well, and I sing them for you. I'm gonna find myself a pagan girl who understands that God has said and rocks my world. Chant in the circle as the sun and moon, then dance round the fire to a goddess too. Rock all night to the morning, and Pearl is gonna find myself a bacon girl. Back in college, Mary was an 80 pie, and as fine as any you have seen. But she blocked for the god and the goddess if they didn't wear a pink and green. And Belinda, she was a wild girl. She could dance, she could ride, and she could scream. But the only God she adored and served were Mary Jane and old Jim B. I'm gonna find myself a pagan girl who understands the goddess and rocks my world. Chant in the circle as the sun and the moon and dance round the fire to a goddess too. Rock all night to the morning, a girl's gonna find myself a pagan girl. was her goal, but she had one favorite big problem with me, I would not let her save my soul, and then it was a new age mystic, dolphins, angels, crystals, dreams, but her idea of a wild good time was chilling from the Pleiades, I'm gonna find myself a vegan girl who understands the goddess and rocks my world, chant in the circle as the sun and the moon and dance round the fire to a goddess too. Rock all night to the morning, a girl's gonna find myself a pagan girl. Girl. 